So good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to the Communication and Signal Processing Seminar. I want to start by first um, acknowledging Kate Goodwin, who's the who's the the work behind the scenes to make this happen. So she doesn't get enough uh, face time. And I also wanted to thank the research groups um, at NCIS and SP for supporting this. So today I'm actually delighted to introduce our speaker today. It's um, Ayalwadi Ganesh, who is a, an associate professor in the School of Mathematics at the University of Bristol in the United Kingdom. And that's partly why we are having the seminar at this time. Uh, his, his research interests are very broad. It includes large deviations, queuing theory, random graph dynamics, and decentralized algorithms. And he's actually about, he's adding a lot of things in this decentralized algorithms, but his gossip, um, he's looked at peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, chunk, peer-to-peer -peer protocols, uh, he's looked at epidemics, um, he looked at healing, healing mechanisms, and so on and so forth. Um, he hasn't described much of what he's did, but he got his PhD a long time back at Cornell. And after that, since then, he's been in the UK. He was at um, HP lab uh, in, in Bristol for a while. Then he was at Microsoft Research in Cambridge. And uh, since then, he's been at the uh, University of Bristol. I'm uh, very familiar with uh, Ganesh's work, and I've always enjoyed uh, reading his stuff. And especially, I've followed the early queuing theory. I mean, all the other works too, but especially the queuing theory work and work on large deviations, which was culminated with book, Big Queues with Neil O'Connell and, uh, and, and Damon Vishik, which is a very nice book. So he's won several awards for his research, including Inform's Best Publication Award in 2005 and the ACM Sigmatrix Best Paper Award in 2010. Uh, with that, I'll give the floor to uh, Ganesh. Ganesh, all the rest. Thanks, Vijay, for, for the invitation and uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, let me yeah, make this full screen. So um, uh, today I'm going to uh, speak about uh, a multi-armed bandit problem. Uh, and this is joint work with several people. It uh, started a few years ago when I was uh, uh, visiting Sanjay Shakote at UT Austin, and we uh, started chatting about this. Uh, we worked with a couple of uh, PhD students at UT Austin, Abhishek Sankar Raman and Ranshi Chavla. Uh, and uh, since then, uh, more recently, I've continued this work with a couple of colleagues at Bristol, Henry Reeve and Connor Newton, who's our PhD student. Uh, so um, I'll be speaking about uh, a few joint papers of ours. Uh, and uh, I'll assume very little prior knowledge. I don't assume that you know about multi-armed bandits and I will introduce the problem. And uh, do feel free if you have questions to uh, uh, unmute yourselves and ask at any time, or if you type it in the chat box, uh, Vijay said he'll uh, monitor that. Uh, okay, so this is the uh, plan of my talk. I'll start with some motivation. And like I said, uh, I don't assume you're familiar with multi-armed bandits, so I'll give some preliminaries on them. Uh, in the single agent case, which is the classical setting. Uh, and then I'll move on to the multi-agent version of the problem. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, present our main results and give only the prefaced outline of the proofs, just some of the ideas that go into the proofs and skip all the gory details. Uh, okay, so here's, uh, here's the problem that we want to look at. Uh, say you have um, someone special visiting you and you want to take them to the best restaurant in your city and you want to find out which one it is. Uh, well, one, the only way to be sure is to go to all of them yourself and try them all out, but that's, uh, uh, that's too expensive in both time and money. So what you would normally do is maybe try a few, but also ask your friends. Uh, and that's uh, roughly uh, uh, what the, the kind of setting we are thinking about. Uh, but for this 
approach of asking your friends to help you identify the best restaurant, there have to be some simplifying assumptions. And in this context, that means there's uh, that there is one ranking of restaurants on which everyone agrees. And this is, of course, unrealistic. People have different preferences. Uh, some like Italian, some like Chinese, and they won't agree on which is the best. Okay, so that could be an extension of the kind of problems we are looking at, but in the simplest setting, we assume that's not the case. Um, then secondly, the, uh, even assuming that there is a ranking, um, restaurants are not perfectly consistent. Every time you visit them, you may not get uh, uh, the same ranking, but again, we assume that there, there is some numerical measure of quality you can associate with the restaurant, and then every time you visit it, you observe a random variable with this distribution. So you get a random numerical score, and the mean of this is the quality measure. And, and again, maybe mean is not the appropriate measure, maybe you want the 90th percentile or uh, you want to be 99% sure that you get something good, etc. So there are other things you could look at, but, uh, but then that could just be uh, functional of the quality. So it all, uh, quite often we can reduce it to just looking at the mean. Uh, and the goal then is to, ask whether there's some simple and decentralized mechanism for us to identify the best restaurant by uh, somehow combining information from different people. Okay, and uh, that was maybe a, a, a toy example, something uh, that could, that has, uh, Greater monetary significance is uh, uh, display ads on websites. So in response to search terms, websites uh, decide uh, which ads to display and uh, based on click through you, uh, the revenue they earn depends on uh, how, how much users click through on these ads. And so it's important to them to decide which ads to display. And somehow, again, they are learning what's the best ad to display for a given search term by presenting some ads to uh, users of the website and recording what the users are doing. Uh, now, the number of potential ads is obviously very large. Uh, and typically, also, if you have uh, a major website like BBC or CNN, it won't be hosted in one place. It will be hosted in a huge number of locations. Uh, and then uh, each of these servers might take measurements independently. And you could, it's not impossible, you could combine this all this information at some centralized location and make decisions. But what we are looking at is do you have to do that or could you do almost as well with much less information sharing in a more decentralized way? Okay, so that's uh, another example. And then, okay, there, there can be plenty more examples you can think of, such as how do you choose the best way to commute to work or what brand of uh, uh, TV or some other consumer good do you want to buy? And in all these, con and in these contexts, at least, there are two kinds of questions you could ask. One is how do you make optimal decisions? Uh, and this is the kind of question that say people working in operations research would be interested in. Uh, but another question is how do agents actually make decisions? So how do agents decide which consumer good to purchase? And that might be something that people, that economists or people in marketing might be more interested in. Uh, but that's not the type of question I'm going to talk about today. It's more how to make optimal decisions that I'm going to talk about. Uh, okay, so uh, with those preliminaries, let's start with the uh, classical multi-armed bandit problem, which looks at these types of questions. 
so you have uh, a certain number of actions to choose from. So which of these ads to display on a website, for instance, these are your possible actions. Uh, we call them arms in this literature. Uh, the term comes from slot machines, which are also called multi-armed bandits in casinos. Uh, and they, you can pull one of these arms and uh, you might get a pay, you have to pay in some money into a slot, you get a payoff when you pull an arm usually zero, sometimes a big amount, and possibly the arms have uh, different payoffs uh, and you don't know. Okay, and so uh, you have to figure it out. Uh, time's going to be discrete. And every time you play an arm, you get a reward, which we uh, denote by xit for the reward on the i thumb at time step t. And we are going to make fairly standard assumptions that the, that the reward sequence on any arm uh, is an iid sequence, independent and identically distributed sequence of random variables. And on distinct arms, these are mutually independent. Uh, also, while we might like to associate such a random variable with every arm and every time step, what is observed is only what happens when you play an arm. You, you, uh, if you uh, uh, choose a certain uh, route between your home and work, you only observe how long it took you to commute along that. You don't observe what happened if you had done something else. Okay, so this is the setting, and then the agent has to decide which arm to play in each time step. And that decision can only be based on past choices and observed rewards. Uh, okay, and what's the objective? What's the agent trying to do? Uh, they are trying to maximize their reward, uh, but we can restate that in a certain other way. We can say that they are trying to minimize their regret and the regret is the difference between the reward they would have obtained if they had played the best arm in every time step, the expected reward they would have obtained, and the expected reward on the arm they actually played. Okay. Uh, so we are looking at a static policy of always playing one, one arm, the best arm, and comparing that static policy with a dynamic policy of playing different arms at different time steps, uh, but we are only looking at expectations. And the goal is, loosely speaking, to minimize the long run regret. You might either have a fixed time horizon over which you're trying to minimize or you're trying to minimize somehow simultaneously over all time horizons. So, Ganesh, just a quick question on that. So, the assumption is that if you have a network of any, I mean, n agents and each of them playing on the regret would basically be uh, the sum of the regrets of all the agents together. Is that also a thing in some sense, or are you just looking at one typical agent? Uh, for now, I'm still talking about the classical single agent setting. I'll come okay, to the sorry. multi agent setting, but yeah, basically, okay. So, there you could either look at the sum or you could look at what happens for a particular agent, but I'll come to that later. Sure, sorry, I thought we uh, were talking about that. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 we are still in the very simple single agent setting. Maybe everybody knows that, in which case, uh, sorry for going so slowly over No, 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 it, that's fine. I'm I think not... it's good to have that. It's good, <laughs> it's always good to do that. Uh, assuming that knowledge, yeah. Okay, so uh, what I want to emphasize is that there's uh, that this kind of problem involves a trade-off between exploration and exploitation. And what do I mean by that? So initially, you know nothing. You might try each arm 10 times and then decide forever to play the best thing you have seen so far. Uh, but that would be a terrible strategy because uh, you, a certain suboptimal arm might just purely by chance have given you a better uh, better performance initially, and then you'll end up playing that forever. So you, th there should never be a time when you stop exploring and exploit what you think is the best arm. 
but equally, you can't say I'm going to spend, a, give a budget of 10% to exploration because as time goes on, you become more and more certain about the payoffs on the different terms. And so you want to reduce the, progressively reduce the budget for exploration over time. So these are somewhat intuitive ideas. And the question is, what's, what's optimal between uh, a fixed total budget for exploration and fixed fractional budget for exploration, et cetera. Uh, and the other thing I want to emphasize is that regret is defined with respect to expected reward and not sample path reward. And the reasoning behind this is, okay, this, the sample path reward is just fluctuating due to randomness. You can't possibly optimize this because you don't know, even if you knew which was the best arm, you don't know just by chance whether some other arm is going to do better in the next round. So you can only optimize the expectation. And that, so it's fair to define regret only with respect to expectations. Okay, so that's the problem formulation in the single agent setting. Uh, and I want to say what is already known in this setting so that we can compare it with what happens in the multi-agent setting. Um, so we are going to, in this talk, just look at the simplest um, case of uh, Bernoulli rewards. That means that uh, it's like a coin toss, heads or tails, you get $1 if it's heads, not, or yeah, and nothing if it's tails, but the coins have different probabilities of coming up heads. That coin comes up heads with probability mu i. Okay. Uh, and uh, for notational convenience, we uh, order the arms in terms of decreasing mean reward. Uh, mu one is going to be the best probability of success. And we'll denote the gap between the best and the second best by delta. Uh, and the regret, uh, as I said, is the best mean reward you could get in capital T time steps by always playing the best arm. Uh, less what you actually played. So if you played um, IT in the T time step, your mean reward is mu sub IT, and this is your cumulative mean reward, and the gap is the regret. Okay, so uh, two questions naturally occur by once we have posed this problem. So how, how well could we possibly do? Uh, uh, what's how small can we make the regret and are there fundamental lower bounds on what's achievable? And the second question is, okay, are there, given that something is achievable, is it possible to do so efficiently in some sense? Um, okay, so let's answer those. So the fundamental lower bounds were given. Uh, so this is a problem that has a long history going back to in fact, going back even to the 1920s or 30s, I believe, in terms of algorithms, but the first uh, formal work, uh, theoretical work was done in the 50s, I believe, or early 60s. So uh, I didn't check the year of this. It's late 50s or early 60s. Uh, and Lyon Robbins proved that uh, any algorithm uh, incurs regret up to time t growing at least logarithmically in t. Okay, so this is the slowest regret can grow. And then there's a constant in front of the logarithm. Uh, and this comes from all the suboptimal arms and each arm contributes this, this amount to the regret. So the numerator is how much worse it is than the optimal and the denominator is a measure of distance between these two probability distributions, the Bernoulli mu one and the Bernoulli mu i. Okay, and the distance is in terms of relative entropy or kullback leibler divergence, uh, which I hope you're all familiar with. And then you're also familiar, you also know that I shouldn't quite use the term distance. It's not a metric in the usual sense, but intuitively it, it tells us how distinguishable these two distributions are 
uh, and so how easy it is to tell them apart. Uh, yeah, capital T is, uh, is either a fixed time horizon or uh, a rolling time horizon. So I'm, I'm uh, looking at the total regret up to time capital T. So this is some large number. After a thousand time steps, how much, uh, how many times have I got it wrong in some sense? Uh, okay, so the prefactor is telling, uh, uh, yeah, in the prefactor, the numerator is telling us that if you're close to the best possible, uh, you should you suffer less regret. But on the other hand, if you're close to the best possible, it's hard to tell them apart. So you end up playing this arm more often, and therefore you suffer more regret. Uh, okay, and th these are some details. We, we have some bounds and approximations for this kohlbach like divergence. It's related to uh, the arm gap and this uh, approximation. In fact, there's an inequality that this is bigger or equal to the, the right-hand side. And that's uh, this is a special case of Pinsker's inequality, which relates the KL divergence uh, to the total variation distance between two distributions. Okay, so this is the most classical result about uh, uh, multi-armed bandits in the single agent setting. Uh, I've shown it for uh, Bernoulli random variables. This is all true for sub-Gaussian random variables as well. Uh, if you have heavier tails, there's uh, more recent work on uh, bounds and approximations, uh, which I won't go into. For today, it's enough to just think about the Bernoulli case, but also to keep in mind that it's fairly easy to generalize to the sub-Gaussian case. Okay, and um, so that's, uh, that's fundamental bounds and there are algorithms that there's a famous algorithm called the upper confidence bound algorithm. Uh, and basically you keep track of how many times you've played each arm and what's the empirical mean reward you have observed in those plays. Uh, and then at each time step, you play the arm, which has the highest empirical mean reward. This bit is intuitive, but not quite. You, you also, give some weight to exploration. So this is the exploitation part. And then you explore. So arms you have not played that often, you give them a higher weight. Uh, and this log T term is somehow saying you should progressively decrease the amount of exploration you're doing. Uh, and that's, that's it intuitively. And uh, okay, then this particular choice looks a bit magical and uh, yeah, it's not immediately obvious why this, uh, but this is what you need to get optimal or close to optimal performance. Uh, but at least roughly it's intuitive, I guess, that this comes from exploitation and this comes from exploration. Uh, and the UCB algorithm achieves logarithmic in T, regret scaling, but not with the best constant. And then you can, uh, achieve the lion robbins lower bound with a variant of this known as the KLUCB algorithm. And there is in fact a Bayesian algorithm. This was proposed way back in the 1930s, long before bandit algorithms were formally studied. And this was proposed not by uh, a mathematician or a computer scientist or an OR person, but by a medical doctor and this is asymptotically optimal. Okay, this was proved much later, but that uh, algorithm which was uh, proposed in the context of clinical trials is asymptotically optimal. Okay, so the main message so far is that uh, here's the problem formulation. Uh, there are fundamental lower bounds and there are efficient algorithms which can achieve those information theoretic lower bounds. So now we move to the multi-agent setting. So again, same bandit problem. Uh, and 
the reason for looking at multi-agent settings is in situations where the number of arms is large. Uh, the regret uh, in the single agent setting would involve a sum of regrets from all these arms and will also be large. It'll scale roughly linearly in K. Uh, and that's not good if K is very big. Of, and so if we also have settings when, the, when there are many agents, it's mm -hmm. then tempting to somehow uh, use these multiple agents to learn faster and reduce the regret. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's roughly the setting. Now, in order for the agents to collaborate in some way that they should communicate, and uh, we assume there's some communication graph over which they can do so. Um, so you can only talk to your nearest neighbors on this graph. Uh, and there are also some kind constraints on communication. You, you shouldn't talk too often, or you should only send a limited amount of a message of limited length every time you talk to someone. Okay. Uh, and then the objective, um, the most natural objective is that each agent wants to maximize its own long-term reward or minimize its own regret. But we will also, we'll mainly look at cumulative regret and then I'll comment about the per, on the per agent regret. Okay, and I should also say what we so do not. If, that's, if you have, if you are looking at every, um, so if every agent wants to maximize its own long-term reward, is that is that more a game setting? I mean, why would you want to collaborate then? I mean, in the sense, that's the, or it's like an, yeah. Okay, so there are versions of this problem that I won't talk about where it becomes a game setting. Uh, but here it's a collaborative setting because the distribution is the same for each agent. So, uh, yeah, maybe I should clarify the uh, model a bit more. Uh, whichever agent uh, plays a certain arm, they get a, a reward with the same distribution. And they can all play, time, time is discrete, but they can all play the same arm in the same round, but they get independent realizations of the reward. Okay, so it's, if you like, it's different instantiations of the same arm. You're not but pulling if, literally if the same. To, if, if I still want to maximize my own long-term reward, then I may be interested in just minimizing my regret and I don't need to help out other agents in some sense. Uh, I see what you're saying. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you could uh, you could do more exploitation without doing exploration. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, okay. That's a good point. Um, okay, so let's say that, uh, yeah, let's say we want to uh, minimize cumulative regret and then it'll turn out that you, you um, couldn't have done better in some sense. It'll turn out that uh, there's a collaborative algorithm that achieves the lion robin's lower bound. So you might as well collaborate, but, but you're right. In a sense, you could have uh, done better by trying to exploit more and explore less and free riding on others exploring. But at least up to order terms, you don't gain anything by doing that. Yeah, okay, that's, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, but I suppose, uh, I hope the setting is clear. Yes, so if different agents play the same arm um, in the same round, they don't see the same random variable. They see two independent realizations of the random variable. So if two servers display an ad, they are displaying it to different people who may or may not click on it. Hey, uh, Ganesh, this is uh, Lei here. So uh, just curious, so if uh, the network is fully connected, so it's like a centralized setting, but you have N agents, uh, what would be the best policy in that setting? Um, so, yeah, so I'm going to talk about all that. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> so okay. I'll yeah. come to that. Maybe not the best policy, but 
order optimal best policies. Okay. So, yeah. Sure. Thanks. Okay. And since I uh, put in social learning in the title, I should clarify that we don't, that there's a whole body of other work on social learning. I guess we should have just called it learning on bandits, but we had a paper titled social learning. And uh, I want to clarify that this work doesn't fit within the framework of social learning, which is the following, uh, that there is a, that again, you have a collection of many agents, maybe infinitely many agents in the setting. And there's a true state of nature and they can choose an action and the reward will depend on the state of nature, which is unknown. And each agent gets its own private signal about what the true state is. And this is noisy. And then uh, they can't share inform they can't share the, these signals they received, all they can, but you can observe what previous agents did. And so you have to decide what to do based on your private signal and the, your observations of what previous agents did. And this is a very interesting and very difficult problem. And there's a lot of work on it. And uh, I'm happy to chat informally later if anyone wants, but I'll skip. Uh, but this is not what the talk is about. Uh, okay, so the setting is the same, the model and notation. So uh, let's say that at, in each time step, uh, an agent plays an arm, but can also communicate with one of its neighbors in the graph. And these communications should not be too long. So for instance, you could pass on, uh, you can pass on one recommendation, say, uh, I think this arm is the best, but you, you should not be able to send your estimate of your UCB bounds for all K arms. That's too, too much information and that's not allowed. Okay, I'm just being informal. You, these are in the paper, you can have more precise uh, definitions of how much is allowed. And again, same questions, are there fundamental lower bounds and what can we achieve? Are there good algorithms? So, uh, yeah, so, so there are two extreme situations that are easy to study. If there's no communication, then every agent has to act independently. So each of the agents achieves is, uh, incurs at least the lion robins regret. So N agents achieve N times the regret and you cannot do better than this with no, well, or, you can achieve this with no communication. So with communication, you can't do worse than this. So you can at least do this. Uh, and the lower bound is centralized. Suppose you could pull all the information, then effectively you are acting like a single agent. And so Lion Robbins tells you, you must uh, incur at least this much regret. You cannot possibly do better than this. And so the question is with only a limited amount of communication, can we achieve this? Can we get close to it? How close? So in the centralized uh, comparison, I was just thinking, I mean, you have, you still have N, I mean, sort of N agents who can play simultaneously, right? So, so you can get N samples of the same data. Is that, is it still a valid comparison with the Lion Robbins lower bound? Yeah. Uh, you, at least you can't do better than this, right? So, uh, so think of them playing sequentially rather than simultaneously. Somehow makes it worse. Okay, you. Uh, yeah, I'm just saying that you could have. I mean, what was sequentially done could be replicated uh, much faster. So the time horizon there should be some log in the log. You could perhaps it's t by n in some sense. Uh, as it goes. Yeah, yeah. So you're saying this should be log of n times t rather than log of t. Or the t by n, because I can take the time and chop, because I can basically, what I was doing in a sequential single agent uh, in a centralized case, I can repeat, make all the agents, I mean, since I can simultaneously play things, they could all, and I get independent samples, I could basically do all the, what I was doing in a block of time, n steps, do it in one shot. So basically, in some sense, I should be chopping my time horizon down by n, right? 
No, so this is the aggregate regret. So in, in time horizon T, each of N agents is taking an action. So there are in total NT actions being taken. Okay. And so, yeah, you could, you can't do better than log of NT here because there are NT actions being so taken. I guess I was visualizing the following. I mean, I have, I mean, it's centralized. I have one particular sort of, uh, I could call him the, uh, in some sense, a coordinator who says, okay, all of you play these arms. You and they do it. And basically then the coordinator says, okay, I mean, he can determine what arms to play um, by everyone. And so in that, that case, you would get a factor of T by N and something you're chopping time down by a factor. And it's only a constant output. It's not pretty. Yeah, you're, you're not, yeah, it's only a constant. So we don't need to worry about that, but sure. you're, you're not chopping time down by N. So in each, uh, time step, there are n actions being taken, and somehow these have to be taken simultaneously. But even if you could take them sequentially, observing what other agents acting in the same time step before you got, then you would have the centralized agent would take yeah. nt actions in t time steps. <laughs> Okay, so, okay, let's skip that, yeah. but yeah. Um, anyway, so this is what a centralized agent achieves and this is what happens with no communication and there's a factor of N in front. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so there's a big gap between these two. And the question is uh, with limited communication, are we close to the zero communication setting or the full communication? or the fully centralized setting. And uh, hopefully we are close to this and that's uh, what I'm going to claim. Uh, so I'll say a bit about, so, so there was a sequence of uh, uh, papers we had. So uh, the first one uh, was with Abhishek and Sanjay Shakotai. Uh, and uh, here we assume that G is the complete graph uh, and we presented an algorithm there which could achieve aggregate regret, which scaled like this. So uh, let me break this apart. So first there is a log T term. There's a term uh, whose regret grows with time with the correct scaling. <coughs> and the prefactor has K as you expect. Uh, but it also has uh, an n log n term. So it depends on, uh, <coughs> it scales linearly in the number of arms, which it does in the centralized setting as well. Um, okay, and this additional term, uh, yeah, I'll say something about this in a bit. There's also a constant term, which again has the k plus n log n term, and then there are poly log n terms. Uh, and uh, okay, and this also depends on the gap between the best and second best term. Uh, so we are typically going to be interested in scenarios where the number of arms either scales linearly with the number of agents or uh, is bigger. Uh, usually, if, okay, if there are more agents than arms, each agent has to incur at least log T regret, uh, and then N agents have to incur N log T regret. So uh, theoretically, you can't have better than the N here. Uh, in applied settings, the either the K term will dominate or these two will be similar to each other. Uh, so in either case, we are within uh, polylog N of the optimal time scaling of the regret uh, and also of this constant term in addition. <coughs> okay, so I've given- uh, Can a, I, uh, just a quick question? Sorry for interrupting. Uh, so if we look at the case like the uh, example we talk about um, finding a restaurant in a city, uh, is that 
curious, is that also reasonable to assume T is much larger than K and N or T may be at the same scale with K and N? Uh, good question. So do we, uh, are asymptotics in T mm -hmm. appropriate? Mm -hmm. uh, right, right. Yeah. Okay. I, that That's a valid question. You, we might want to make decisions very quickly, but mm -hmm. from the theoretical point of view, we are looking at large T asymptotics. Okay. <laughs> so indeed in practice, the constant term may be much more important than this term. But what we are trying to achieve is the best prefactor in terms of the log t term, in front of the log t term. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, the main, so there are also lots of ugly constants in front of all this, which I have hidden. So none of the numerical constants are visible and uh, some of them are large. So this looks a bit nicer than it is, but at least in terms of scaling relationships, we are within polylog N of optimal. Uh, then in subsequent work with uh, Ronshi Chavla as well, we both generalized this work and improved the bounds. So we considered general graphs, and then there's a communication matrix, which tells you the probability of uh, talking to each of your neighbors in each time step. <coughs> and um, uh, a quantity called the conductance of the graph comes into the bounds, which I won't define, but it's in the paper. Uh, and again, I'll just state the result. So uh, it was a bit more careful analysis. So we didn't assume that all arms from three onwards were as bad as arm two. Uh, maybe they were more dis more easily distinguishable. And then uh, for the regret, we get almost the correct prefactor for log t. We get one over the gap rather than the gap divided by the relative entropy. And then we get these additional constant terms, uh, which I will say a bit more about when uh, talking about the proof techniques for where, where these things come from. Um, that it should go with the number of arms, I guess, is intuitive, so I won't say much more about that. Okay, so uh, we've narrowed the gap with optimality uh, quite a lot. So we are very close to the Lyon-Robbins gap, but not exactly there. Uh, and in uh, more recent work with uh, Connor Newton and Henry Ree, we uh, closed that gap. Uh, so for the prefactor for the log T, we get exactly the Lyon Robbins gap, and then the constant terms are pretty much the same. Okay, so these are the results uh, that we were able to obtain for the model. And so just to summarize, uh, essentially, we can do as well as the centralized model with very limited communication. So that, that's the main takeaway message. At least if you are happy to work in the large T asymptotics. Again, and for finite time, uh, these are more important terms and then perhaps things are much worse. Uh, okay, so now a bit about the algorithm. Uh, I'll start with the algorithm in the paper of Chavla et al. This is the main algorithm we used and only slightly modified this. Uh, and what it does is to, uh, I'm going a bit slow, but uh, okay. Uh, so we'll partition the arms into sets of uh, e roughly equal size, K over N. And we are going to assign uh, so part, not, not quite partition. So split arms into these sets, which should cover all K arms and assign one such set to each agent. Uh, and this set is called the sticky set and it never changes. Uh, and then there are going to be a few more arms which will change uh, over time and these extra things come from recommendations. So it's easier to show with pictures. So we have uh, 10 arms and four agents. 
So I'm going to split the arms among the agents. Uh, if I wanted a partition, I guess, I, yeah, you could also partition the arms, in which case you don't repeat any arms, or you could create equal size sets with some repetitions. So inside the box, I've shown the sticky arms. And the idea is that together, these should cover all possible arms. And these are things you are always going to keep exploring. So every arm uh, keeps getting explored forever, even if with decreasing frequency. And then you initialize these non-sticky arms at random, let's say. You just give each agent a couple of extra arms. And now, uh, how, do, how do these things evolve over time? The sticky arms don't evolve, but these are going to evolve over time. And the way they do that is that time is split into phases of growing length. And within each phase, each agent plays UCB as if it's a single agent problem. And at the end of the phase, it will recommend its most played arm to one, it'll randomly choose a neighbor and make a recommendation. And then agents which receive recommendations will pick one at random and uh, they will replace the less played arm in, in their non-sticky set. And again, it's easier to explain this with pictures. So here is the same uh, setting. So after the first phase, uh, what I've shown in green is the arm which was most played by this particular agent. So agent one played arm two most often, agent two played six and so on. Agent three played one, agent uh, four played two. And these arrows say who's going to make recommendations to whom at the end of this round. Once making a recommendation to two, two to three, four also to three, and three to one. Okay, so uh, now these agents which receive recommendations are going to, so Agent one recommends arm two to agent two. Uh, so agent two is going to adopt this recommendation, but then it, it should throw something else away. Otherwise the, the number of arms it has to keep track of will grow forever and that will uh, make its regret performance worse. Uh, so it, it can't change anything in its sticky set. This, this has to stay the same. So when it receives a recommendation, it has to throw away one of these arms and it throws away whichever of these was uh, uh, the worst in that phase. So it turned out that these were the sticky arms that were worse for these agents in these phases. So it's going to accept the recommendation and evict these arms from its dynamic set. And this agent received no recommendation, so it doesn't have to evict anything. Agent uh, three happened to get two recommendations. It's going to randomly pick one of them and accept that. Okay, so that's the algorithm. Uh, so a that's... quick question on the communication model. Mm -hmm. So the uh, so in every round, I mean, you just so that. The P, the uh, the graph, the probabilistic setup that you had was basically it says that one of those neighbors would be picked, right? With some problem. I mean, it's not like an independent trial in each, and then so it's possible that in this phase, even though you tried to communicate, nothing got sent. So you though though the constraints we impose are on that you can communicate just once per round. We are actually allow you to communicate. I mean, we actually communicate only once per phase, and a and a phase is a lot of rounds. No, no, I don't. Yeah, no, that's right. But I meant in the sense in the the way the you should think of that. Um, so this is basically you have a distribution on your neighbors, and one and one of those neighbors is picked with that that distribution, and when you mm -hmm. decide to communicate, as opposed to sometimes basically nobody getting two. Right, right. Yeah. Again, for the analysis, it doesn't matter. You could, there could be times when you don't communicate at all, mm -hmm. or you could ensure that you pick one proportional to those probabilities and communicate. Yeah. 
yeah, so for the analysis, it doesn't matter. You could even uh, make those choices independently so that you uh, communicate with more than one or you fail to communicate. But fail to communicate would uh, would hurt your regret, though, right? I mean, because it should hurt it in a different way because you know, that whole phase, all the learning in that phase is, the, is not... Is yeah, it. so you do waste some phases, but... Yeah. You won't do it that way in practice, but indeed. But I think for the asymptotics, it doesn't matter. It it goes into yeah. It it doesn't matter. And in the second one, you were saying that uh, you were deciding at random between the two recommendations you received. I mean, is there any benefit? I mean, looks like they will not be because you're saying your final algorithm will not uh, uh, is is reaching the lower bound. But would there be any reason to think that you should accept both of those recommendations and throw out two? I mean, if, there, if you have a relative, but you don't get any relative measure in the sense, this is how good that uh, measurement has been in some sense. Yeah, you could communicate that. Again, that wouldn't be to add one, one estimate to one recommendation would not cost you a lot. Okay. So you could do that, but again, it was easier to analyze as well. And uh, yeah, so we, we we didn't assume you get that information. So because you don't have the information, all you can do is randomly pick one of them. Well, if you had that information, you could even decide to, uh, even um, agent three could say, uh, whatever I got recommendations I got from uh, like six and two were given as a recommendation. They're both better than one. I could throw one and three both in some sense. Right? Yeah, you could even do that. Yes, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, and so the only thing we changed in the work with Connor and Henry Ree was to, instead of playing UCB in each phase, we play KL UCB. Uh, and so somehow our algorithm inherits the uh, asymptotic optimality of this. And we also uh, allow, so if here, if you get a recommendation of an arm which was already in your sticky set, uh, then uh, you, you could, we don't necessarily keep these two extra arms. You could continue to evict things. And uh, so you could end up with a smaller set. So both those things help us. Uh, if you get a recommendation of an arm which you already have, you still do the eviction. So the set of arms you have can decrease slightly more. Uh, uh, and question. Play. Yeah. So uh, when the uh, arm is recommended, does the, uh, like the confidence set is communicated as well or it will be uh, restarted at the, at the new agent? Restarted. Restarted, okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so that was, uh, that was the algorithm. Uh, and okay, so I just have one slide about the proof, which is there's only one key idea behind the proof. And the idea is that the best arm spreads like gossip. That the uh, best arm, the, the spreading of, we only want to keep track of how the best arm spreads. And once it's reached everybody and stays with everybody, they are playing. UCB or KL UCB on a small set of arms, which includes the best arm, and then we know the regret. And so the question is, how long does it take for them to learn the best arm? Uh, and that's a rumor spreading process. So in each, so, um, okay, and the rumor spreading process, so let's forget the, the bandit problem for a moment, and let's look at a rumor spreading model, which is again a discrete time model, let's say. And in each time slot, a node that knows the rumor will communicate it to another a neighbor chosen uniformly at random if it's a graph, or another uniformly at random if it's the complete graph. Uh, and here you should think of the rumor as just the best arm ID. There are lots of other arm IDs which are also spreading, but we don't care about them, okay? 
So what's known about the rumor spreading model is it's very robust for discrete time models, continuous time models, and so on. Uh, the rumor reaches everyone in some multiple of log n time steps. So for a large population of n nodes, everybody learns the rumor after log n time steps for the complete graph. And on general graphs, it's log n over this conductance is an upper bound on the rumor spreading time. And so there are some nice graphs known as expanders for which this conductance is a constant. And then again, it's just a multiple of log n. Uh, and then there are bad graphs where this is some polynomial in n. Okay, and then that would also go into your uh, bounds for the bandit problem in that case. Okay, and so um, for the coming back to the bandit problem, we make the faces longer. And the idea is that once you learn the best term, the chance that you think it's not the best during the phase keeps getting smaller and smaller because the phases are longer. You correctly identify it as best. And so the probability of making an error in a phase gets smaller and so it can only happen uh, finitely often. Uh, and so there's some last time, so some random time, but some last time after which everybody has learned the best term and everybody will always recommend the best term. And so it will never disappear from the set of, from anybody's uh, set of arms. Okay. And so from this time on, the process is frozen. Everybody is playing uh, UCB or KLUCB on a fixed set of arms consisting of just K over N plus one or K over N plus two arms. And that's it. That, that's basically the intuition. So you get in the, for the log T term, this is what determines your regret. And the constant term in front is this random time for everybody, for the rumor spreading to, for the rumor to spread, which is log N phases or log N over the conductance phases. The phases are growing in size polynomially but that's still a poly log n constant. Okay, so that's uh, that's pretty much the intuition of the proof. So I'm pretty much out of time. So I'll very briefly show some simulation results, uh, which are all thanks to Connor. Uh, and so here we have on the complete graph we have plotted re regret over time for different algorithms. So this was the uh, uh, gossip insert eliminate algorithm from the paper with uh, Chavla, Shankar Raman and Shakote. Uh, and then we did two tweaks to this paper, one of which was to play KLUCB that gives this one, or the other tweak is to also eliminate one extra arm that, that also gave a small improvement. And if we put these two together, this is the regret we get down here. Um, okay, so that you do have to go fairly long in time to for the regret to really start saturating. So maybe a few thousand time steps, whether that's from the application point of view, that does feel a bit long. And so maybe the constant terms also important. Okay, so here we plotted the regret of the different algorithms as a function of the gap between the best and the second best arm. As the gap gets smaller towards the left, the regret increases. But again, with the KLUCB, it increases less sharply than with the original gossip insert eliminate paper. We also did some simulations on different graphs. So the complete graph is at the bottom, as you might expect, it's the best. We were quite surprised at the ordering between the cycle and the star. We thought the star should somehow do better, but at least on these simulations, the cycle graph, which is bad for rumor spreading, did better than the star, which is excellent for rumor spreading. Okay, so understanding that might be future work. And then some more future work, I should say. So the additive constant is large indeed. I think Lay already raised this point. Uh, 
So from a practical point of view, this might matter more and we do need better algorithms uh, for this and maybe better analysis as well. <clears throat> Contextual bandits, yeah, so different types of restaurants, can you take that into account? So the formal way to do that would be contextual bandits. There's a, there's some nice initial work by uh, Shalva and Sankar Raman and Shakota. And there are many different ways you could contain models of contextual bandits. They've studied one. There's plenty of space for others. Uh, malicious nodes, this is an interesting problem. What if I recommend something bad to you? Uh, can you recover from that? There's again been some nice initial work on that by Vial Shakota and Srikant, but again, there's scope for uh, maybe improving and extending this work. Uh, so with uh, Connor Newton and Henry Ree, we've just started working on a version of this with continuous, with arms whose rewards are continuous functions on some metric space. And uh, yeah, hope this, this is still in its very early uh, phase. Other variants of the problem could be best arm identification. There's actually a huge amount of related work. I don't have the time to do it justice. There's also been nice work on Bayesian versions of this problem by uh, Andrea Goldsmith and uh, Anusha Lalita. I don't know that work well enough. So I didn't want to comment on it. Um, adversarial bandits, uh, again, that could be an interesting extension and there's plenty more. But I'm also out of time and I should stop and take questions. Thank you. So Thanks a lot, Ganesh. So yeah, I keep this up for a bit maybe, longer. Yeah, go ahead. No, no that's fine. But I, I'll, I'll let others ask questions and then maybe I can ask mine afterwards. Sure, maybe I can ask a quick question first. Yeah, Lee. Hey, yeah, uh, very interesting talk uh, first. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, so question is, the, the, in terms of the, the gap between the best and second best arm delta, uh, is this delta here assumed to be independent of both K and N? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that, yeah, we, we do assume that. And that's indeed, uh, somewhat artificial. Yeah, uh, can you comment maybe, or uh, if it's uh, like it also depend on K and N, or uh, any like how, how that can change the result? Okay, so the second result we uh, so in the first paper, first work we started with Abhishek and Sanjay, we were a bit sloppy with the analysis. So the result was stated in terms of a single delta. Uh, but in the other two later works, it took all the delta i into account. So there it is, ex all the gaps are explicitly in the bound. And so it's uh, uh, so it, it's not independent of K and N in that setting, if you like. Yeah, but if the delta itself, for example, uh, delta one is a function of K or N, for example, delta one could be like one over K uh, maybe that also requires some refinement of the algorithm based on the delta as well? I don't think so, because we get a bound which is in terms of the delta i, and mm -hmm. that does match the lyon robbins lower bound. Mm. I mean, there may be some additional thing because you're, I mean, you don't have, you have a covering, right, of the k over n, and maybe there you can make some, uh, how you actually do the combinatorial partitioning, maybe there is some the extra arms that you throw in that might have some of that. But it may, that, that's but minor, that's a, I don't think, maybe minor, I would think it's extremely minor. Yeah, yeah, that's a small amount. Oh, there's one more thing I should say. So this comes back to uh, uh, Vijay's earlier question. So the bounds are for the cumulative regret. We didn't look at, uh, so I didn't state the bounds for the single arm regret, but let me go to that expression and talk about it maybe. Okay, so the cumulative regret from all the arms involves uh, uh, delta, okay, this, exp this regret for the i-term contribution. Um, 
And so how is this cumulative regret split between the different agents? Uh, so each agent gets a regret, which depends on its initial endowment of arms, what went into its sticky set, the ice that went into its sticky set, and that's what it contributes to the sum. So if it started out with a bad sticky set, uh, then it does suffer higher regret uh, because it's not allowed to throw away those arms uh, by this algorithm because then if, you, if individual agents are allowed to throw away arm, arms, then you risk those arms disappearing from the population. And then if you've prematurely thrown away the best arm, uh, then you're in trouble. So each agent by being responsible for certain arms is, uh, is indeed paying a higher price. Uh, so, this is like real life. What you are born with affects your chances, but but it doesn't. Uh, uh, your regret isn't amplified beyond that. Okay, so it it doesn't make it worse for you as you grow up. So that's uh, how things go into the regret, into the cumulative regret. Perhaps in that case, I mean, if you were allowed that, then maybe it's some scheme by which you could resuscitate an arm at random that might help them. Yeah, uh, you could, yeah, you could do that or you could uh, shuffle these around, uh, the sticky sets around periodically. But so th that was also why the initial paper with Sankar Raman had somewhat worse results. So we didn't, in that case, uh, Force the force these arms on different agents. So there, there was more of a case of resuscitating arms or throwing away arms, etc. But there was a penalty to be paid for that. Whether whether you could achieve both, I don't know. So my uh, so I had a slightly different type of uh, two questions. Which was one was to say that now you had these independent arms being played. But what if there was some sort of a, you know, I mean, you have this graph, but this graph is also a Markov random field in some sense. There's a dependence on the structure. So who plays what would also matter. And maybe that depends on the arm. Each arm has a different Markov random field for the. Uh, do you mean not all agents can play all arms? Maybe I didn't no, but in No, and more in terms of the dependent structure of the vector of rewards that you get in some way. So it's like if two agents are, I mean, in, in, in some sense, they could be extremely dependent. So you're not getting any, I mean, here you sort of rely uh -huh. somewhat on independent samples. But if you had for each each arm, there was a different dependent set in some sense, and you want to, you're forced okay. to sort of pick more independent samples to get your learning. And, and, and that's a, that's a trade-off which would get hurt, which will hurt you a little bit more in some sense. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, I understand the question. Yeah, that's a very interesting one. So you're saying that for each arm, um, maybe it's maybe this is easier to think of in the Gaussian case, there's a covariance matrix which over the agents, which defines how correlated the rewards on that arm are. Yeah, yes, that, yeah. that could be interesting, I, I have no idea. And the other one was somewhat related in the sense now the arms here are independent, but suppose your arms were had some structure like a linear bandage or something, would you, because then by sampling something you're getting, and you don't know the uh, dependence. So when you're partitioning, you have to do something interesting to make sure you can. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't have a lot of intuition for the contextual bandit case. So well, I was talking more about the linear band. I mean, it's a, yeah. So I was talking a linear bandit as in the arms are, so by sampling one arm, I get an information about other arms in some sense because of the oh okay the impact, I see that kind of setup. Right? Okay, that's very. But interesting. I don't know the dependence ahead of time. The dependence will affect me. I mean, if I know I have all the samples of the centralized location, I obviously learn better in that sense. Mm. I can still have independent uh, your independent setup, but the fact is that each arm uh, at each agent there's dependence, which is the same across everyone. And so the structure should improve your learning, but I don't know, in this context, it may hurt it as well. 
Yeah, uh, I don't know about this. There's been some work on the model where the agents don't communicate, but you observe the rewards not only on arms you play, but on arms your neighbors and the draft play. Mm -hmm. So uh, that model has been studied, which is a bit like what you are saying. But yeah, it was, more uh, mine was a different setup, was more, I think there are other contexts where, uh, so you play a particular arm, the arms have some dependent structures. If I play arm one, I get information also about arms three and four, for example, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so then I have to decide how I'm going to partition and how, but I don't know the dependent structure going ahead of time in some ways. Okay. Um... Yeah, you could, then you are in effect, you are choosing subsets of arms, so to speak, but. Um, you also want the more, I mean, if you have, you can have a smaller subset that is more informative and then for some nodes and, and so on and so forth, right? Yeah, but you still want coverage in some ways. Yeah, the, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, it's a good question. So playing one arm gives you information about another arm. Uh, and somehow you need to take, no, I don't know if work like this. So that's, that's an interesting formulation, definitely. I mean, in the single agent setting, I know of work on this, uh, I think uh, lies, I mean, one of lies bounds applies, but I think, um, Mesh Roth or some Mesh Roth or some work on that. And I think even Mark Lillard had some work in the past. And this is I'm talking about many years ago, 2010 or something. But, yeah. Okay, I should look at this work. Yeah, this, this sounds interesting, but I'm not familiar with it. Uh, and any other questions from anyone else? If not, let me thank you for an excellent talk. Um, and stop sharing. Thank you. Uh, maybe I just stop the recording. I'll just, uh, I had a one second. I can stop the recording.